Um, in this study uh, uh, by Passos, they actually they actually go through inappropriate and appropriate thoracotomies, and they talk about timing, and so they basically make the assumption. If they, if they tell you that they lost pulses at the trauma bay, that's about five minutes of downtime. And they sort of agreed upon that and then went forward from there in their, um, in their evaluation of those charts. And if they lost pulses just outside the hospital, that really meant somewhere around 15 minutes, right? Because no one ever says, oh, you yeah, know, I lost pulses on the field, but I've been doing CPR the whole time, right? No one ever says that. And then you have to sort of uh, recognize your own limitations in knowing how to do the procedure, right? So now steps to the actual procedure, actually doing a curvilinear um, uh, cut when you're doing your incision, right? So that means actually starting at the sternum and going all the way up. So you're actually going into their armpit, even though you're starting under the nipple, you're going all the way up in the line of, uh, of the ribs. Oftentimes we just go straight down because we're used to making nice small little holes for chest tubes, so we go straight down onto the bed, but you actually have to go up. So making appropriate cuts, because otherwise you limit yourself, you limit your view. You're not able to actually get into the, the chest cavity, into the mediastinum. Um, you want to cut through the intercostal muscles, right? You know, it's oftentimes when you're doing this, you're under somewhat duress, right, yourself. Um, so you have to recognize you want to use, even though there's like a thousand different instruments on this tray, you actually only want to be using about three of them, right? Actually, you know, four if you include the rib spreader. Um, so you want to have the least amount of movement back and forth, because every time you turn or move something, that's when, and you have a sharp object in your hand, that's when someone else gets injured, or you yourself get injured. So um, things to be careful of. Um, you want to use Mayo scissors when you're actually cutting through the muscle, when you're cutting through the pericardium, so that you have something that can cut through stuff but has a lesser chance of stabbing someone else, right? Just trying to minimize this stuff. Once you're in the chest, there's a high incidence of actually cutting through the phrenic nerve. Again, uh, people get really excited about doing this stuff, so it becomes harder to see. Um, oftentimes, when you actually have, you find the hole, you may actually cut through one of the coronaries and not recognize that you just made a cut and it went through a coronary artery and now you've given someone a whole other problem on their hand, right? So, so it, I suppose you can say an MI in an alive patient is better than, than having a dead patient. We can argue that, fine. But at the end of the day, they might bleed out from these or bleed out from the inframammary uh, blood vessels as well. Um, again, knowing how to put the rib spreaders in. I've done... Um, <coughs> my fair share of thoracotomies in the ER, and every single time I still put the rib uh, spreaders in, the ba in backwards, right? Because intuitively, you want the crank to be on the top, right? Except that you actually want the bar to be on the bottom so that in case you have to clamshell them, meaning going across the sternum and opening up the right side, you can actually do that and not have the bar in your way, right? But like I said, inevitably, every time I put them into the chest, I always put them in backwards. And then if you are cross-clamping the aorta, and there's really, really very little evidence that actually shows that it helps, um, especially in the cracked chest, because by then you've exsanguinated by the time you've gotten to this. Identifying the aorta sounds really easy, right? This big honking hose in, in, your, in the posterior chest that you can sort of palpate and feel, and then you put the cross-clamp on it. Except when you're doing this, there's obviously no blood in the system, so now the esophagus and the aorta feel really similar. And then, in all the hubbub of all this stuff that's on the table, inevitably you might pick up the wrong clamp, right? And so there's a specific type of clamp that helps to clamp down vessels without crushing them, as opposed to a clamp that actually is meant to crush the vessels or meant to crush tissue. So now, great, you've saved their life, but they don't have an aorta because we put the wrong clamp on, right? So uh, again, things to be careful of when you're doing this. Um, so this is the correct one, is the one that has a little curve in it, as opposed to the one, so the one that has like an actual, um, like a right angle almost to it, as opposed to the nice, the, the nice coker clamps that are sort of just curved ever so slightly. Right. Um, damaging the heart itself when you're when you're delivering it from the pericardium, we get all really aggressive about it, and we and we deliver it out, and that can actually cause trauma to the heart itself. If you're overly aggressive, you actually pull off some of the vessels, pull off things like IVC and SVC. Kind of sucks. 
Um, forgetting to check for right side injury, so you, because you're obvious to see the left side, it's hard to see under the right side, so you have to look back there to find your injuries as well. <coughs> and then we're talking about why there are towel clamps and stuff in here. It's because sometimes you may also have um, pulmonary hyalur injuries, right? And so when you're aggressive about pushing the lungs out of the way, doing all this stuff, you may rip all of that off. The pulmonary vasculature is actually very fragile um, and pulls very easy. Uh, there's a societal cost that comes with this as well. So this is that same Passos paper um, looking at appropriate versus inappropriate uh, thoracotomies and then kind of going through who was appropriate. So this is who was appropriate, who they did it on, who was inappropriate, and it's interesting how many uh, inappropriate uh, chests were cracked. But I thought this was a really interesting breakdown, right? How many... Um, how many people had blood work done? How, much, how many people had imaging that they didn't really need? Um, how many people went to the OR, right? Uh, if you crack up a chest, it has to be in the OR, but then all the trauma patients thereafter, we only have one trauma OR at night. Right? So that, mean, that, means require, that, that means calling in more staff if you have more patients coming in. Um, ICU beds, right? Uh, how many of you guys have had ICU borders in the ER because there's no space upstairs, right? So you're taking up an ICU bed. And the most impressive one was actually looking at blood products. So in this study, there was 123 ED thoracotomies. 63 were inappropriate. Uh, there were three needle sticks in this study, 335 units of blood collectively, right? So that's a lot of blood. Um, and there was no survivors amongst the inappropriate group, and there was no organ donors, right? We don't ever really think about or organ donation when in the heat of the moment, but that is... That is something to consider, right? At the end of the day, you want to make some positive out of these things. So organ donation is also a factor into some of this stuff. I mean, the thing is, so common, you're not really pumping blood in these patients anyway. Like, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily fair to say that because this person got an inappropriate thoracotomy, you wasted blood on this. Like, well, it's the idea of, should that person have even been cracked, should their chest been have, have been cracked to begin with, right? So there was there were 63 inappropriate thoracotomies. That's a lot of resources utilized for someone that didn't need to have that procedure to begin with. But they would have gotten blood. But you wouldn't have given them blood. You would have called them. You didn't want to have 20 minutes between hospital CPR. That person's dead. If you didn't need a thoracotomy on a live person, you should probably be rethinking your diagnosis. Right. Exactly. Right. So these are patients who didn't need it, who you would have declared dead, but then you did it. Now you have to deal with it. Right. Um, and this was an interesting article. You can't see um, what it says at the top, and it says, well, what's the harm in giving it a try, right? And we do that. I think this is the end game that we end up sort of having in our, the conversation we have in our heads and with each other is, well, like, what's the downside? At least we try, right? Like, we throw the kitchen sink at some of our patients sometimes. But there is a downside. So um, I encourage you guys to actually look up. There's a Medscape article that Amal Matu wrote. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting description of one of his... Um, ED thoracotomies as, as he was finishing up residency. So um, it's about him and his attending, and it was, well, let's, let's just give it a try, right? It'll be a learning opportunity for you because uh, this is the last time you'll be able to do a thoracotomy with an attending to supervise you. Um, so let's, let's give it a shot. And then he ends up stabbing the attending, and then that, the patient was HIV positive. And I mean, so there are downsides to, to all of these things. So I highly recommend looking up this article. It's, it was actually very good. That's a really good point. I had uh, a few patients came in at the same time uh, with PSWs, all from the same shooting. And trauma was, was doing a thoracotomy on one of the patients who came in. And I was resuscitating one another patient. The other patient was relatively stable. <laughs> And, you know, I had pretty much done a, 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 an aggressive resuscitation on, on my patient who was still alive, was intubated, had a cordis, was getting blood. And I had pretty much reached my limit of what I could do with my resuscitation. And I had to actually go grab the trauma center and be like, hey, you doing this thoracotomy, this person's dead, you can come save the life of this person. And he did. He came. They took, they took the patient right up to the OR and she survived. And that, and that guy was dead. And, you know, maybe she might not have survived for a little bit longer while they did their thoracotomy. Right. Um, and then just a side note that's not actually included in here is if you do have someone who is survivable um, and you do crack open their chest, uh, we are looking for other places to put in your lines for resuscitation. You now have their heart open. Um, and so one of the things that I do is I actually take the IV tubing and I, and I make a small hole in the right atrium and I put the tubing directly into the atrium and you do a little purse string around it. 
Right, so now you have nice big resuscitative uh, line going right into the heart, and it works as a great resuscitative. I mean, your heart's right there, right? Why are you putting with a with a cordis somewhere when you have the heart in your hand, right? Um, and and but the next time we pack a chest, if you want to learn how to do it, I'll teach you how to do it. Uh, <laughs> but it's a nice tool, right? Like, why are you why are you futzing around trying to get a central line somewhere when the best central line is the one that goes directly into the heart? Um, but so just to move on, uh, so that we can get to the good stuff and not be like wildly over time, since we already are, is is really quick. What are our what are our rules at Kings County? Um, if you have a patient who comes in with no signs of life. Um, in order to be declared death on arrival, and, and this should, let me, let me preface by saying, this should never come into consideration when you're deciding to do a procedure or to, to do something for a patient, but just as a sidebar note. If you have a patient who comes in and they are uh, dead on arrival to the emergency room and you don't escalate care, then that's considered still, or, or you don't escalate care, you continue on with what EMS was doing, right? So EMS is doing CPR, if you continue CPR and then it doesn't work and you decide to call it, that is considered death uh, on arrival. If you, if they have, C if someone's doing CPR and then you decide to do surgical procedures, uh, meaning you crack open their chest, you put in a chest tube, you start putting in lines, things where you are now invading into their skin, then that is considered an ED death. Again, that should never enter your thought process, like should I do this, but just so that you guys all know it's, um, what are some of the things that you choose to do? So, for the people who want to go to work, yeah. so I really want them to maybe get a couple minutes of the demonstration. Absolutely. So we're going to be really quick, and then we're going to videotape it. Um, it's going to be hard to see some of the stuff once you guys get set up. Um, so step one um, in all of this is personal protective equipment, right? So Kylie is going to put on, for now, what we have in the ER is gowns, uh, surgical gowns. We are changing that so that we have the plasticated thinner ones. No, no, no. We're just doing the check.